Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's a very great pleasure and privilege to be here with you today. Um, as you will have gathered, I'm going to concentrate my remarks to you this morning on the use of the FIDIG Red Book on international road projects. And I'd like to just start very briefly by touching on some of the key features of the Red Book. Now, of course, uh, Sven Poulsen, in his remarks, um, went through all of the FIDIC books in some detail, and I certainly don't want to repeat what he has just said to you, but obviously just to set the scene for the comments that I'm going to make, um, where a Red Book is used... The works are designed by the employer, often through the engineer, on behalf of the employer, but it is the employer who is responsible for the design of the works. The contractor might be responsible for some elements of the design, and I've listed some elements of the civil, mechanical, electrical and or construction works, but I think it's fair to say that where parties are considering using the Red Book, either all of the design or the very largest part of that design is assumed to be designed by or on behalf of the employer. And so given that the employer is designing the works, it follows from that that where a red book is used, there is a very comprehensive description of the works in the contract. And that description is set out in the contract drawings, specifications, and indeed in a detailed bill of quantities. Um, and when I say a set of specifications, I mean a full and very detailed set of specifications. So the Red Book assumes that the works will be described fully in them because they are being designed by the employer. Oh, Mrs. Sven was talking to you about the yellow and the silver book, and I will draw some comparisons principally with the yellow book. Obviously, if one takes the yellow book, um, there the contractor performs the design of the works, and his obligation is to design and build the works in accordance with a set of employer's requirements, to use the phrase that FIDIC uses. Now, I think it's important to note at the outset that the employer's requirements in a yellow book contract are very different to a set of specifications in a red book contract because um, where a set of employer's requirements are used in a yellow book, that is a set of functional requirements which are there to describe what the contractor is to design and build, so they set out the function rather than the detail of the works. Whereas when one compares that with specifications in the Red Book, it is intended that the Red Book specifications will be a full and complete description of the works to be built. It's also important to note, of course, that the Red Book is widely used internationally, and a good example of that, and, and Sven referred to this, is the Red Book has for many years been used by contracts which have been financed by multilateral development banks. And indeed there is a form of the Red Book known as the Pink Book, um, which is published um, to set out some of the clauses that particular multi -deve multilateral development banks use. And Sven showed that to you. Uh, the banks in question include the World Bank and the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. So whilst it is very much based on and is a variant of the Red Book, um, it does show at the outset the breadth of use of the Red Book internationally. Comments were also made earlier on about risk allocation, and I think it's fair to say that both the Red and the Yellow Book adopt what would generally be re referred to as a fair risk allocation, and by that one means a, an allocation of risk where risks are allocated to the party which can best bear that risk. And that has been the philosophy of FIDIC since the first edition of the Red Book was published back in 1957. So both the Red Book and the Yellow Book certainly do, in my view at least, um, adopt the principle of a fair allocation of risk. 
when one looks diagrammatically at the scheme that there would be in relation to a Red Book um, contract, obviously we can see that the employer is at the very heart of the scheme, as one would expect, since it is the employer's project. And one can see that there are contractual relationships between the employer heading in two directions. First direction upwards on my slide are various consultancy arrangements with, I have used in the examples on my slide, an architect and an engineer. There will be different consultants involved, of course, depending upon the nature of the, con of the particular project. But again, I've given the, an architect and engineer as my example. Then moving down in the other direction, um, there will be the, the building contract between the employer and the contractor. So under the building contract, the contractor will be doing the construction works only, and the design of those works will be done by one of those consultants up the chain. Um, then, of course, one, when one looks below the contractor, there will be inevitably a series of subcontracts, and all of those subcontractors will be working under the contractor's responsibility. And so just continuing with the discussion about key features of the Red Book, we've discussed the design risk um, in which the design of the project is with the employer and the contractor only builds in accordance with that design. The other fundamental question to ask when one looks at the procurement model set out in the Red Book is how the contractor is paid. And the answer to that, first of all, in the form of contract as it is actually published in the general conditions, is that there is a full and detailed bill of quantities and that the contractor is paid in accordance with a remeasurement of those quantities. So the quantities are not binding quantities, um, and those quantities are there so that the contractor can build up a tender price. But in essence, under the form of contract in its base form, the contractor is paid on the basis of a schedule of rates set out in the bill of quantities. And that's why it is said that it is a remeasurement contract. And so one will only know the final outturn, contra outturn price of the project at the end when the project is completed and is finally remeasured. It is, of course, also possible that the parties might want to have a fixed lump sum price instead of a remeasurement schedule of rates approach. Now, FIDIC recognises that this is commonly affected in the marketplace, and accordingly, when one looks at the Red Book, the Red Book in its published form has both the base conditions of contract, which, as Sven said, are 20 clauses, then it also includes in the same volume guidance for the preparation of the particular conditions. And that guidance includes an alternative set of clauses which the parties can use if they want to do so to convert the Red Book from a remeasurement contract in its base form to a lump sum contract. And so it is possible, if the parties so wish, uh, to turn this into a lump sum contract. One then, of course, has to ask the question, well, what is most feasible and most attractive? Now, of course, that will depend upon the requirements of the, the particular project. Obviously, if one is contemplating the use of a lump sum contract, um, then it follows from that that the works at the outset must be sufficiently and fully described such that the contractor can develop a proper lump sum price. If at the time of tender the design is not completely developed, it's highly developed but not completely developed, it may well be that the contractor cannot um, develop a lump sum price. And what might happen in practice is whilst the further drawings are being issued by the engineer during the project execution, the contractor might then say, well, those additional drawings amount to variations and changes in the works and might then make a claim as a result. So, so there are certainly advantages and disadvantages with both the remeasurement approach and with the lump sum approach. And I think it's fair to say that a decision has to be made on a project-by-project -project basis as to which is the most appropriate payment model to be adopted. Uh, the, the clauses published by FIDIC are flexible and they can adopt to both approaches. Um, 
When one looks by contrast at the yellow book, the yellow book is undoubtedly a lump sum contract. Uh, And the reason for that is that the contractor is taking design risk. And so it's quite difficult uh, from an employer's point of view where the contractor is doing all of the design um, for that to be quoted, from the employer's point of view, from certainty, for that to be quoted on the basis of a schedule of rates. And so as one would expect, expect in a design and build situation, then that is a lump sum contract. Obviously, when one asks the question, well, which is cheaper? Well, that's always a a very difficult question to answer. Obviously, one thing one can say, of course, is that when the contractor is quoting a lump sum price for a design and build arrangement, he will inevitably quote more risks in his price. And, of course, we all know that the more risk a contractor takes, the higher the price is at the end of the day. And the contractor will be quoting in the yellow book situation risk because he is doing the design, it's his fundamental obligation to achieve the employer's requirements and of course at the time the contract is priced and the tender is submitted he won't have completed his design, he might have done some initial design but most of the design will be done in the construction period. Now I don't want to suggest to you that one or other of those approaches be lump sum or remeasurement pricing is inherently better or worse than the other. I think in my experience it's always been appropriate to take a view on the basis of the individual project and what the parties in that individual project are seeking to achieve. When one looks to how the Red Book is implemented, as Sven has commented, it's implemented by an engineer um, and he's usually a consulting engineer, invariably appointed by the employer. He may usually carry out the design, but the design can be done by another. And he, the role of the engineer is to supervise the construction of the works. The engineer acts for the employer, but he's under a duty to act fairly when he's administering the contract. When one looks at what does that administration involve, basically two main functions. Um, first of all, to certify payments. So there is a duty on the engineer to act fairly when he's certifying the amount due to the contractor, also when he is making determinations in respect of additional payments or extensions of time. Again, since he is implementing the contract risk allocation, again, in those situations, he's under a duty to act fairly. Of course, outside his strict contract administration roles, um, he will also, of course, have his consultancy agreement with the employer, and under the terms of that consultancy agreement, he will have separate duties to keep the employer informed as to the progress of the project, because it is assumed that the engineer is the central figure acting for the employer in the execution of the contract, and so obviously the engineer is under duties to keep his own client informed as to how the works are progressing. Now, Sven, in his remarks, showed you all of the suite of contracts. I'm not going to focus on all of the suite this morning. As I've said to you, I'm focusing on the Red Book, and so I thought I should just say a few words about the other forms of contract that would be needed to implement a Red Book scheme. Now, if you cast your mind back to the slide I had with that chart a moment ago, you will recall that above the employer I had various consultants and I had an architect and an engineer in my consultancy bracket. Obviously they will be appointed under a separate contract with the employer and the FIDIC publishes a form of contract for use for those types of arrangements. Uh, The most commonly used one is the White Book, which is a form of consultancy contract, and that is the first one I have on the slide. If you also recall, in my chart below that, I also had um, the contractor, and then below the contractor, I had various forms of subcontract, and FIDIC also published, as Sven said, um, a form of subcontract for use with the FIDIC Red Book 1999. Now, one could ask the question, since one's focusing on the key contracts with the employer and the key building contract, why one needs to consider these things. But, of course, one must remember that this is a project as a whole, and 
this really just demonstrates that where one is looking to execute a contract on the basis of works designed by the employer, FIDIC does publish the complete suite of documents that parties can use to implement that project successfully. So whilst the building contract will also always be the central form of contract, it should never be forgotten that there are other important forms of contract and FIDIC publishes forms to deal with those so the project as a whole can be realised. When one turns to look at the usage of the Red Book, um, I've just put some examples here. Um, Again, Sven commented about the international use of the Red Book, and I certainly agree with that. Um, When one looks at the use of the Red Book um, in Central and Eastern Europe, I myself am aware of it being used in Slovakia, in Poland, and in various other countries. I've also, of course, referred to the use of projects being financed by international development banks, and they use the Red Book. I mean, one can see that because they publish their own special version of it. I put on the slide there, and you can see various road projects in Central and Eastern Europe executed successfully on the Red Book financed by multilateral development banks. And again, on the second slide there, some further examples of Red Book Book contracts implemented uh, with international development bank financing. Now, we've talked a great deal about um, risk allocation. Um, Now, obviously, when one looks at risk allocation, in the abstract, that inevitably has an impact on the contractor's pricing, But it's equally important, of course, when one comes to execute the project, because then when one executes the project, obviously some of those risks may occur in practice, and one has to look at how those risks are allocated and how one manages those risks, both practically and in accordance with the contract terms when they occur. And so I've just selected a few key risks which seem to me to be particularly important in relation to road projects executed under the Red Book. And I'd like to start with the subject of design changes, because this is an issue which I see very frequently in practice. Now, of course, we've discussed design quite a lot already. As we all know, under the Red Book, the employer provides the design to the contractor. One advantage of that, of course, is it gives the employer great control over the design that the contractor does because, of course, the employer is specifying precisely what it wants the contractor to do. Um, So that is excellent from the point of view of giving the employer control. But, of course, as Sven was saying in his remarks, when a party has control of something... By its very nature, it undertakes responsibility for it. And so the converse of the employer being able to specify the design is that the employer is responsible for any errors or mistakes in that design. And perhaps more importantly and more frequently in practice, um, if the employer wants to change the design, then the employer is going to have to instruct a variation under the contracts to give effect to that. And again, one very common example that I see in the context of road projects is where the employer, during the execution of the works, decides it wants to change the road alignment slightly. Now, if he wants to do that during the execution of the works, yes, of course, the FIDIC contract gives him the power to do so, but then, as a consequence of the engineer instructing a variation then the contractor may be entitled to an additional payment and also possibly to an extension of time if it delays him in completing the works. And so one then has to ask the question, well, under the Red Book situation, how does one manage that risk? And the answer to that is good project management. It's very, very important that prior to the building contract being signed, the design is developed as far as it can be, and also that the employer is as sure as it can be that this particular alignment, to give the example that I'm using, 
is what it wants. So it really is the classic question that you know, the foundation of every successful contract is a clear scope of work which is then adhered to and is only changed if that change really is needed. And so there's a practical question of management that one really wants to keep changes to the alignment and the design in general during the project execution to the minimum possible, which requires additional time at the beginning in planning so that the employer is really sure, or as sure as it ever can be, that what it is asking the contractor to do at the outset is what it wants. And so that, that's the situation under the red book. When one looks at the situation by contrast under the yellow book, of course the yellow book, uh, the contractor actually does the design itself in accordance with some functional requirements specified by the employer. And so as Sven was saying, one consequence of that is that the contractor is given much more flexibility in how it achieves those employer's requirements and has the right more or less, to achieve those employers' requirements as it wishes. So again, in the yellow book situation, it is during the project's execution even more important that the employer stands back because the contractor basically has the right and the obligation to achieve, to have flexibility in how it achieves the employer's requirements. And so if the employer then intervenes in that process by instructing variations, then again, the contractor will then be claiming uh, additional time and cost and possibly relief from its performance obligations. So I say all of that um, not to be difficult or frightening in any way, but to simply make the point, and and it's true for all projects, um, that the employer, so far as it can, should decide at the outset what it wants and so far as it can stick to that during the execution We all accept that change is inevitable during project execution, but I would suggest to you that this type of issue can best be managed by good project management and minimising the changes during execution to the minimum that really are needed. Another major risk in my experience um, in respect of road projects are unforeseen geotechnical conditions. Now, Under the red book and indeed under the yellow book, it is a crucial part of FIDIC's approach to a fair risk allocation, that the the, the risk of unforeseen ground conditions, both in terms of time and cost, is allocated to the employer. And so the consequence of that under both of these books is if there are unforeseen ground conditions, and they do occur, that the contractor is entitled to more money and more time. And is this a major risk on road projects? Well, certainly in my experience, it very often is. And I've given two examples on the slides. First of all, where the rock encountered is actually much harder than is anticipated. And so that is more difficult to excavate than one would originally think. And that takes longer and costs more to do so. So that's where the conditions are harsher. Uh, So if you like, where the the ground is harder, of course, you might say, okay, I understand that, then what if it's softer? But there can also be difficulties with softness too, because if the the ground is too soft, it may not bear the weight of the road and the traffic on it, and additional foundation works may be required. As I've said on the slide, additional piles may be required. So again, one then has to ask the question, well, how does one manage that risk? And the answer to that, again, must be that um, the geotechnical investigations that are carried out prior to the signing of the contract and are provided to the contractor at tender and upon which the contractor bases its price must be as accurate and as comprehensive as they can be in the circumstances. Now, one recognises, of course, that unforeseen things might happen, but certainly when I look at the issues I see in project execution, I've very often seen only very limited site reports being provided, 
perhaps of only limited parts of the road. Um, and then when one gets outside the conditions um, where the geotechnical information has been provided and one gets into other parts of the road, those site conditions are very, very different. And perhaps it could have been anticipated that they might be different if a more comprehensive or a different set of geotechnical surveys had been carried out. So again, in a project like a road, I would urge you to look very, very carefully at the scope of the geotechnical investigations which take, which take place prior to the contract and upon which the contractor bases his price so as to minimise unhappy surprises during the project execution. Another major issue which is inherent in the nature of road projects is the question of access to the site. And again, this question of access is common to both the red and the yellow books. Um, and it's perhaps not surprising that under both of those forms of contract, it is the employer that is obliged to give access to the site. It is, after all, the employer's project. And so it follows from that that if the employer is unable to give access by the due date, then the contractor is entitled to additional payments and also an extension of time. And certainly in my experience, um, this is quite an acute issue in relation to road projects given their very, very nature being a very long, a very long and narrow site. And I've set out on the slide three potential problems that I have seen um, over the years. First of all, delay in land acquisitions because, of course, uh, the road will pass through yeah, many, many different people's lands and so one needs to get the right to actually build the land, build the road over all those different landowners' properties. Um, so delays in land acquisitions. Um, again, the best way one can manage that, of course, is to ensure that the employer either has acquired ownership of or has acquired the right of access to the land before the construction starts. I think that's very, very important that that is done because very often I've seen issues arise where there have been problems in discrete parts of the road where the employer cannot give access to those particular parts but is then asking the contractor to work around those, those bits that are not available. That then gives rise to difficulties because the contractor has not planned his work on that basis and so inevitably the contractor will then make a claim for cost and time relief as a result. It is, of course, also the case very often that projects of this nature are not entirely new roads, but they are either expansions of existing roads or at least at some point they will connect with an existing road system. And again, issues then arise with respect to giving the contractor access in those situations. Um, and I've used on my second bullet point on this item, the example of an expansion to an existing road where one needs to keep the existing traffic flowing whilst the works are going on. Um, and again, that gives rise to difficulties with respect to access, with respect to maintaining the, the flow of the existing road. And certainly, I think the way that that can best be dealt with is obviously it has to be dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis, inevitably. But that is where some quite clear thought is, needs to be given prior to the contract being let. And so the specifications actually set out quite clearly um, both when the access is to be provided and how the contractor's work is to be planned and executed such that the existing road can continue functioning during the course of the expansion works. And the last point I refer to is disruptions caused by third parties, for example, landowners who don't like the fact that the road is going through their property. And again, one must have a comprehensive plan in place as the employer for managing those risks, because ultimately, under both the yellow and the red book, those are risks which are assumed by the employer. The last area I wish to touch on with respect to these um, issues that arise in um, 
project execution are, of course, social and environmental questions. Um, and under the red book, and indeed equally under the yellow book, um, the contractor is obliged to take steps to um, protect the environment and limit the risks to people. And one can understand that, both generally and specifically in connection with road projects, where, of course, there is a significant risk of damage to the environment, the work is noisy, it's dusty, and it very often goes to unpleasant areas. And so certainly we have often seen in the particular conditions to road projects some fairly sophisticated amendments made pursuant to which the contractor has obligations to manage to deal with and protect the environment, engage with community requirements and so on and so forth. So those are just some examples of issues which we see arising frequently in relation to uh, road projects being built under the Red Book, and indeed they will also apply those examples to projects being built under the Yellow Book. Now we've touched on already and uh, potential amendments to the Red Book, um, and it's certainly fair to say that the, amend book, the Red Book is indeed frequently amended. It's widely used around the world. Um, many government organisations um, have their own varied form of the Red Book. And of course, as has been mentioned earlier, the Roads and Motorway Directorate is itself preparing amendments um, and particular conditions to the FIDIC Red Book. Um, and I, I thought I might just make a couple of comments on some of those amendments from the perspective of the international contractor. Now, obviously, the FIDIC Red Book in its published form includes provision for a cash retention against payments. One of the RSD amendments is to include a warranty bond uh, as an alternative to uh, cash retention. Um, that is an amendment which is commonly made internationally, so it's a very normal amendment to make. And if one were to look at an international contractor who is considering bidding a, a project in the Czech Republic, he would be very pleased to see that that amendment has been made because it will improve his cash flow. Another amendment that I have seen has been made, and again, I've certainly seen this amendment be made in other countries, so I wasn't surprised to see this, is the addition of contractual penalties for delay damages in parallel to uh, general damages. And so if one looks at the Red Book, the contractor is, of course, obliged to complete the work uh, by the stipulated time for completion, and if he fails to do so, the Red Book provides the contractor is to pay de delay damages at the rate specified in the contract. And that, again, is a very normal provision for any form of building contract. So that's what the Red Book in its published form says. The Red Book also says in its published form that the uh, contractor's liability for the delay damages specified at the specified rate is the sole remedy for late completion. And what is being proposed or suggested here is that in addition to the delay damages that are stipulated in the contract, the employer should also be entitled to claim general damages at law for breach of contract. Now, I've certainly seen that amendment made in other jurisdictions, so I wasn't surprised to see the amendment. My only comment um, is that if you're an international contractor looking to at a potential opportunity in the Czech Republic, that provision is something that would give you cause for concern, and so you may very well qualify your tender as a result of that provision. So again, that is a, an amendment I see quite commonly, but it is a very, very sensitive amendment from the perspective of the international contractor. And you say, well, why do I say that? Why am I saying, well, what the international contractor wants? Well, of course, when you are trying to attract people to um, you know, put in bids for projects, you want good bids from good contractors. So the whole purpose of tender documents is to attract bids rather than cause people to decide not to bid or not to qualify their tenders. And so... If one were looking to uh, get tenders from international contractors, again, that is a potential amendment one might wish to think about. Um, the last amendment in that regard, which I would like to discuss in a similar vein, is the question with respect to 
dispute resolution. Now, Sven, in his remarks a few minutes ago, uh, made the comment that, you know, as a lawyer, I naturally love disputes. Well, actually, that's not really true. Um, the one thing that I do like to see are successfully executed projects. I mean, we all want to see a successful project uh, and not a major court case at the end of it. Speaking only, speaking only by myself, and Rick can comment further when he speaks to you, there is no greater satisfaction than actually starting from a project from the beginning, drafting the tender documents, participating in the tender clarifications, signing the contract, and then following it through to a successful completion. That is a very, very satisfactory state of affairs from a lawyer's point of view. I can assure you that's fair. I, I hope I've put you at rest of that. Um, but looking at matters from an international contractor tendering the project for the moment, one thing that the contractor will look at um, is the procedure for the resolution of disputes, recognising that he will only ever have to implement that procedure in a very, very extreme situation. Now, FIDIC in its published form provides for the final resolution of disputes by international arbitration. And what has been done in the ministry's form is to change that uh, to have resolution by the Czech courts. Now, again, I have certainly seen that being done. So I wasn't surprised that that was done. For example, I've seen FIDIC Red Book contracts in Poland where that has been done. And that is a perfectly normal amendment to make where uh, you have a, an employer from one country and a contractor from the same country. Indeed, many contracts in England are done on the basis that disputes will be resolved by the English courts. And so the idea of having court resolution is certainly not an unusual one. Um, and again, it comes back to the question of what type of bids and what type of contractors you are looking to attract to these tender processes. If you are looking at international contractors, then I think they may very well want to see some form of pre-arbitral or pre-court dispute resolution, be that amicable settlement, mediation or some other means, followed by some form of arbitration as the final means of resolving disputes. Again, there are many different arbitration options. I referred to two uh, international bodies, the International Court of Arbitration in Paris and the London Court of International Arbitration. So again, the reason why I make this point is not to suggest that one thing is inherently better than another, but one needs to think when preparing tender documents what type of contractors one is looking to attract to the project, and then that may very well have implications for the provision you select for the resolution of disputes. Now, just a few conclusions, just to try and tie all of those thoughts together. Uh, first of all, I think there are many good reasons for using the Red Book in a road project. Um, they have a balanced risk, balanced risk allocation, but still protects the employer's interests. The Red Book is well accepted and will be familiar to international contractors. It is well supported. As we have seen, it is used by um, many development banks in projects that they finance. And it is effective. Now, the 20 clause arrangement does comprise a complete and clear set of, type, set of conditions which covers most of the major risks that are likely to arise. It has time limits on both parties and, of course, provisions for the resolution of disputes. Particular conditions will, of course, always be required uh, to allow flexibility for both for the needs of the particular client and, of course, for the specific project. Um, and we've looked briefly at some of those amendments which are being proposed by the Ministry. As I have said, some of them are very commonly encountered and will certainly be acceptable to international contractors, such as the warranty bond. Others, for example, might be resisted by international contractors if you were looking to seek to attract bids internationally. But overall, I have to say to you that the Red Book is an excellent basis for developing road projects where the design of the project is to be designed by the employer. Thank you all very much. <laughs>